So you may hear your team talking about macroadenomas and microadenomas. There's a very clear definition. A macroadenoma is greater than one centimeter, and that's all there is to it. But people do present in different ways. Next slide, please. And these different presentations present different surgical challenges for us. Some of you may know that as the tumor grows, the pituitary fossa, which sits directly beneath the eye nerves, becomes expanded, and then the eye nerves can begin to be affected. So as the tumor grows, it may begin to affect a person's vision. There's another way that it can affect a vision in a more sudden um, way, which is if there's a bleed into the tumor, and that's called pituitary apoplexy. And that presents as a very severe sudden onset headache with maybe some double vision or a drooping of the eyelid and some quite unusual symptoms. So the presentation of a pituitary tumor is variable. It depends. Sometimes the hormones are disturbed, either increased because the tumor itself is producing hormones or decreased because the tumor has stopped the normal gland working. As I mentioned initially, there are occasionally rare presentations such as blockage of the fluidville pathways, hydrocephalus, seizures, and very rarely a leak of brain fluid from the nose. We'll come back to that. Next slide, please. So what are the goals of surgery? Well, people will tell you, people will tell you it's to preserve your vision. People will tell you it's to control your growth hormone excess. People will tell you it's because of tumor control. But none of these things matter if you don't feel that your life has been improved by an operation. Now, traditionally, surgeons are very good at measuring biochemistry. So, you know, your blood tests look good or your scans look good or your eyes can see, which are all really valid outcomes. But increasingly, as a body of professionals, we are beginning to focus on improving people's quality of life and survival. So the treatment goal, number one, improving quality of life. Why are we improving your vision so that you have better quality of life? Why are we controlling the hormone excess that you have so that you don't have the symptoms associated with it? Okay, or the medical complications. And long-term control of the tumor is important, but it's important to manage the symptoms of your disease. Next slide, please. So the commonest pituitary lesions requiring surgery are what we call non-functioning adenomas. So pituitary tumors that don't secrete any hormones. Occasionally, we do operate on prolactin-secreting tumors. We'll come back to that a bit at the end. And then there are two most common types of hormone producing tumors, one of which causes Cushing's disease, one of which causes acromegaly or growth hormone excess. Now, there are other pathologies that sit in that area, sit in the pituitary region. Brachy's cleft cysts, craniopharyngiomas, these may be words that are familiar to some of you, maybe all too familiar if you have personal experience. And they provide slightly, slightly different surgical challenges. Next slide, please. How is the surgery planned? Well, the surgery needs input from radiology, ophthalmology, endocrinology, and therefore all surgery really, really must go through a pituitary MDT. You may have heard this phrase. It's a multidisciplinary team. So in our MDT, we have three or four surgeons, a clinical biochemist who looks at all the blood tests, endocrine doctors, um, radiologists, histopathologists, and ophthalmologists, eye doctors. Because everyone brings their own um, nuance to the decision making, especially, for example, the eye doctors. How do you tell the difference between someone who can't see because of glaucoma and someone who can't see because of a pituitary tumor? You need an expert. You need a neuro-ophthalmologist who's familiar with pituitary disease. And all the members of the MDT will have a specialist interest. So it won't just be any old neurosurgeon. It'll be a neurosurgeon with a specialist interest in pituitary disease. It won't be just any old endocrinologist. They might spend all their time looking after people with diabetes, for example. But what you need is a pituitary endocrinologist because there are nuances to making the correct diagnosis and there are nuances to providing the best treatment plan. 
for you. Inferior petrosal sinus sampling came up in the pre-submitted questions and it can be useful. It's only relevant for people who have a diagnosis of Cushing's disease. So if they have too much cortisol, so too much steroid in their own body, there are a series of tests that try and determine whether the excess steroid is coming from the pituitary gland or not. And one of those tests is an inferior petrosal sinus sample. And we can go into we that in more detail if you'd like later on. But for now, I'm just going to leave it at that. But it can be useful. Next slide. So how does the visual loss usually present? These are images of my, uh, of my street <laughs> in different uh, seasons. And I hope you can see that in the right hand side, the sky is visible all around the tree. The peripheral vision is intact. But on the left hand side, it's how somebody who's lost their peripheral vision might appreciate the tree. There are bits missing from the side. I've seen patients who have knocked cyclists off while driving because they simply haven't seen them in the peripheral vision. That kind of thing. It's very rarely noticed by a patient. So people tend to look most of their life in the center of their vision. So you can easily miss that you've lost your peripheral vision. Next slide, please. What happens during surgery? The, the surgery most commonly, although not exclusively, is performed through an endonasal approach. So a small camera passed into the nose, a little bit of bone removed at the back of the nose, and then the tumor tackled. It's minimally invasive, but it is still a proper operation. There are no scars on the face, but you will still have had a proper operation. So you need to tell your friends and family that you're gonna be tired for a few weeks after the operation, etc. Nasal packing can be useful to support the repair. I'm gonna talk a bit more about that. And occasionally we do use a stealth guidance or image guidance. Some practice does vary. Some units will use it routinely. In my practice, I only use it when um, I think people's normal anatomy it, it requires it. So sometimes when people have had multiple surgeries before or in children, um, in very young children, it can be difficult to identify the landmarks, but usually it's not required in pituitary surgery. Next slide, please. How do we stand in theater? We have the anesthetist tends to be at the foot of the bed and the surgeons at the head of the bed. Next slide, please. This is me and my team uh, from just a couple of days ago. Um, on Friday, we had uh, two patients with pituitary tumors. And here I am um, with my senior clinical fellow. It's always an operation that requires two surgeons. Usually it will be two consultant surgeons or a consultant surgeon and a, a, a senior junior, if you like. So my, my clinical fellow is ready to be a consultant any day now. Um, and quite often in, in our team, we'll have three consultants. It's always good to have all those opinions, open discussion in theater. You can decide on various nuances of the surgical approach. Next slide, please. I wanted to go through the operative steps. It's quite a, um, a nicely divided operation, if you like. There's a nasal stage, and then there's an air sinus stage, and then there's a stage where the tumor is taken up, and then there's the closure. Next slide, please. Um, I ought to the instruments that we use. So they're long, thin, blunt instruments, and we just gently swirl them around inside the tumor, and, and the tumor comes out of its own accord. It doesn't it doesn't really want to be in there. Sometimes it's more challenging and the tumor doesn't want to come out. And then we have to sometimes stop before it all comes out because we always say that we will take out as much tumor as we can safely take. Next slide, please. On the right of these three, you can see the actual endoscope. So that's the long, thin camera that goes up the nose. And then a couple of other instruments that we use just to move things around. You can see they're all long, slim instruments. So we don't cause too much trauma to the nose itself. Next slide. So there are some special challenges with pituitary surgery. We mentioned the inferior petrosal sinus sampling, the IPSS. Somebody asked in the pre-submitted questions, what happens if there's a mismatch 
between the side of your tumor and the side of your IPSS. Now, your IPSS is a test only done in Cushing's disease. So if you have not got Cushing's disease, you don't have to worry about it. If your endocrinologist thinks that you have too much cortisol, we as a team, we have to decide, is it coming from your adrenal glands that produce cortisol, or is it coming from your pituitary glands driving your adrenal glands? The IPSS takes blood samples from right next to the pituitary gland, and if the levels of ACTH are very high up there. We talk of a central head to peripheral kidneys gradient. And that gives us the diagnosis that tells us that this cortisol excess is very likely to be coming from a pituitary source. It used to be said that you could tell which side the tumor was on. Now, why was that interesting? Well, it's because sometimes these tumors are really difficult to find. And so it was hope we were hopeful that this test could tell you, if you take from the vein on the left or the vein on the right, it could tell you which side the tumor was on. But we now know that there's so much admixture of the blood flowing around the pituitary gland that it's not reliable. So if you've got a clear lesion on one side on the MRI, your surgeon may well go for that. But I would just say that the imaging is key here and the experience of the multidisciplinary team is key. So your surgeons and your radiologists ought to be looking at a Cushing's protocol MRI, like a special MRI that has really fine cuts and contrast done in a particular way to pick up any abnormalities because in Cushing's in particular, it is quite challenging to identify where the lesion is. And that's part of a bigger conversation that I'm happy to have it on a separate talk if you wish. But that's how sometimes you can get your IPSS lateralizing to the, the wrong side, according to the MRI. Okay. Functional gonadotrope adenomas are very rare, but they I've seen two, um, and uh, they are indeed a special case. Macroprolactinomas, so prolactinomas that are big, are over one centimeter. Sometimes they can be enormous macroprolactinomas. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the medical management that is commonly used for prolactinoma, so cabergoline or bromocryptine, but increasingly people opt for surgery for prolactinoma, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Next slide. People we'll spend two or three nights in hospital. They have a bit of a stuffy nose and maybe a mild headache, and they can return to life activity within one to two weeks. Some people just feel a bit worn out and gradually return to normal activity over six to 12 weeks. Next slide. Hormone deficiency can be a problem after surgery. Happens in about 10 to 15 patients, permanently worse after surgery in terms of their normal pituitary function. And that depends on the size of the tumor, the size of the normal gland, how squashed it is, whether you can even see it, and whether it was working before the operation was. We've spoken about brain fluid leaks that we've tried to um, reduce our rates significantly with the abdominal fat graphs, but there are many other ways that we can repair um, after a pituitary operation. And of course, although the operation is often carried out to preserve vision, it can make vision worse. It's a recognized complication. Some people report loss of sense of taste or smell, which is usually temporary, but as the packing dissolves, it usually returns, but sometimes it doesn't return. So you, you can have an altered sense of smell afterwards and therefore taste. And about 10% of cases, the tumor may grow back. You may need further surgery. Next slide, please. So these are some references of people who've looked at the complication rate of hormone dysfunction and the chance of reoperation. Next slide, please. It's important to maintain regular endocrine follow-up. Normally people have an MRI scan at three to six months after an operation and then every year afterwards to check for recurrence. Hormone replacement is given as needed. And some tumors. I put, for example, Rathke's cysts, but of course all pituitary tumors may recur. Next slide, please. So it can be helpful to keep the nose moist after an operation with a saline douche. 
avoid straining or heavy lifting or nose blowing after the operation. Rest and pace yourself. Try and keep a symptom diary and maintain your endocrine appointments. Next slide, please. So before my final slide, I just wanted to thank you for joining the call today. Thank you for putting up with my slightly rogue outdoor approach. I hope I've covered all your questions, but I'm happy to take more questions in the Q&A. I urge you to visit pituitary.org.uk regularly because we do update the resources there. And I do think they're very well written. You know, it's a useful resource. Everyone actually in the pituitary community, medically, everyone recognizes it's a very good resource. Um, and stay connected, follow up with your team. If you haven't seen your surgeon and you want to see them, get in touch. You cannot underestimate the value of your clinical nurse specialist. They have a huge experience and they can direct your questions accordingly if it's a bit difficult to figure out if you need to see your eye doctor or your endocrinologist or your surgeon. 